Welcome. Today we're focusing on septic shock management in the emergency setting. We want to get beyond just protocols and look at a more actionable physiology-led workflow. The mission is really understanding the modern thinking on the entire circulatory circuit. Okay, let's picture this. A 72-year-old woman comes in, acutely confused. Her BP is 110 over 50 millimeters of mercury, heart rate 88 beats per minute. So she's not technically hypotensive or tachycardic, right? But then you see it's significant modeling on her knee. That modeling, that's shock. Even at those numbers, okay, let's unpack this. How do we look past those numbers on the monitor and actually treat the underlying physiology here? Well, sepsis is basically the systemic firestorm, isn't it? It's the body's own response going haywire. And that response leads to circulatory collapse. Before we grab fluids or drugs, we need to know why the circulation is failing. And there are really three um, core pillars of failure we see. First, there's massive vasodilation. Think nitric oxide causing this profound relaxation everywhere, arteries, veins. It's distributive shock, like the container is just suddenly way too big for the volume inside. Second is capillary leak. The lining of the blood vessels gets damaged, leaky, so fluid just pours out of the vessels into the tissues. Patients get intravascularly volume down, even if they look swollen overall. And third, we have septic cardiomyopathy. The heart muscle itself gets temporarily stunned, depressed, that drops cardiac output, adding a sort of cardiogenic piece to the puzzle. So you've got wide pipes causing low pressure, fluid leaking out, and maybe a weak pump too. And the result of all that is this failure at the micro level, right? The microcirculation yeah. fails. That's the hemodynamic coherence problem, where the big numbers like BP don't match what's happening to the cells. You mentioned that modeling is a huge warning. And we know, what, over 30% of these patients have vague symptoms initially. You can't just wait for the blood pressure to plummet. So what are those specific early clinical signs we should trust? Exactly. We need those canaries in the coal mine, signs that organs aren't getting enough oxygen. We look straight at the brain, the skin, and the kidneys. For the brain, any acute confusion, delirium, altered mental state, that's yeah. a huge red flag for the skin. That modeling, yeah, or cool limbs, or check the capillary refill time. If it's over three seconds, that's significant. And kidneys, mm. urine output dropping off, or you see the creatinine start to climb. These are direct signs of hyperperfusion. Okay, so you're saying trust the physical exam like capillary refill time, maybe even more than the cuff pressure initially, and don't get falsely reassured by labs either. Absolutely. A normal lactate or no fever, that doesn't rule out shock. Not at all. Your clinical suspicion has to be what drives things forward. Okay, so if... Suspicion is high. We need to quickly rule out other catastrophic causes before mm. we just assume sepsis, right? Correct. What are those immediate mimics we need to exclude, maybe with point-of-care ultrasound? Yeah, POCUS is key here for ruling out mechanical shock. We need to quickly look for cardiac tamponade, a massive PE, maybe a ruptured AAA, tension pneumo. Also think about DKA or even adrenal crisis. These need totally different management fast. Get those off the table. All right, let's talk first five minutes. It's chaos. Things happen in parallel, not just step by step. What are the absolute immediate stabilization priorities? Right, it's a simultaneous effort. Oxygen. Target SpO2 90 to 96%. Don't blast them with oxygen. Avoid hyperoxia. It might actually be harmful down at the micro level. Airway. If you need to intubate, resuscitate them first. Get the hemodynamics better before induction. Those induction drugs can cause cardiovascular collapse. Have pressers ready, like right there at the bedside, before you even pick up the scope access. Get two large peripheral IVs or go straight for an IO if you need to. Don't delay giving meds or fluids waiting for a central line. Monitoring in labs. Draw everything up front. Blood cultures times two. Different sites. Lactate. Get continuous monitoring on. Foley catheter in to track urine output. It's a great simple sign of kidney perfusion. Okay, this brings us to maybe the biggest shift in recent years. Fluids and pressors. <laughs> the old give fluids, 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 then maybe pressors idea. Mm -hmm. That's really changed, hasn't it? That 30 milliliters per kilogram bolus isn't automatic anymore. The question really isn't just will they respond to fluid. It's more like can they tolerate more fluid? Mm -hmm. Tell us about the fluid strategy now. The evidence now suggests that just dumping in fluid early on can actually increase mortality. Fluid overload is a major problem. When you do give fluid, choose balanced crystalloids, lactated ringers, plasmolite. Avoid normal saline, that 0.9% sodium chloride. The high chloride load can cause or worsen metabolic acidosis, which we definitely don't want, and give it differently, smaller amounts, maybe 250 to 500 milliliters at a time. Then stop, reassess. Look for signs of fluid overload B lines on lung ultrasound. JVP up, a high VEXUS score. If you see those, stop the fluids, full stop. So solar fluid challenges reassess constantly. And if the mean arterial pressure stays under 65 millimeters of mercury, or if those perfusion signs aren't improving, start pressors early. 
This is really treating that massive vasodilation directly. Absolutely. Get the pressure up, restore some tone to those pipes, and you can start them peripherally. A good proximal 20-gauge IV or bigger is fine to start vasopressors. Don't wait for the central line. First line, generally, is norepinephrine. Target that MAP of 65 or higher. Second line. If the norepinephrine dose is climbing, say, getting up towards 0 0.25, 0 0.5 micrograms per kilogram per minute, add vasopressin, usually a fixed dose, 0.03 to 0.04 units per minute. It works differently, helps spare catecholamines. And if it's really refractory shock or you think there's a heart component, a cardiogenic piece, then add epinephrine. How can we spot that patient who has just profound vasoplegia needing combination pressors right away? A big clue is a really low diastolic pressure, like under 60 millimeters of mercury. It means almost no vascular tone left. Another thing is the diastolic shock index, that's heart rate divided by diastolic BP. If that ratio is over 2.2, that strongly suggests severe vasodilation. Okay, moving on to the non-negotiables, antibiotics and source control. What's the time pressure here? Time is absolutely critical. Broad spectrum antibiotics need to be in within one hour of recognizing septic shock. Every hour of delay hurts mortality climbs, and at the same time, source control. You have to find and fix the source of the infection, drain the abscess, pull the infected line, get the surgeons involved for necrotizing fasciitis or a perforated viscous. This is resuscitation too. Now for the more advanced physiology, the four interface model. This framework helps us use bedside tools to find the weakest link in the circulation and really personalize the resuscitation. Can you walk us through these four interfaces? Sure. Interface one, pump and pipes. The basic macrohemodynamics, we look at left ventricular ejection fraction with ultrasound, but maybe even more useful is the left ventricular outflow track velocity time integral, the LVOT VTI. It's a proxy for stroke volume. A normal VTI is usually above 18 centimeters. So if the patient looks warm, they're vasodilated, maybe hypotensive, but well perfused. Peripherally, they often have a good LVEF, a high VTI, that's pure vasoclegia, needs vasoconstrictors. If they look cold, poorly perfused, maybe clammy, they might have low LVEF, low VTI, that points towards a cardiogenic component needing intertropes like epinephrine or dobutamine. Got it. So the VTI gives us a quick non-invasive look at stroke volume. What's next? How do we link these big numbers to the tiny vessels? That's interface two, macro versus microcirculatory coupling, checking that hemodynamic coherence. This is where the physical exam, especially the skin, comes back in. We focus on capillary refill time. The Andromeda shock trial was really important here. It suggested that targeting normalization of capillary refill time, getting it back under three seconds, might lead to better outcomes than just targeting lactate clearance. Whoa, hold on. That's a huge statement. We're de-emphasizing lactate. Mm -hmm. What does that really tell us about lactate then? It suggests lactate is more of a stressometer than purely a perfusionometer. Yes, it goes up with low oxygen delivery, but it also skyrockets with endogenous catecholamines like epinephrine, driving aerobic glycolysis, even with adequate oxygen. So follow the clinical signs like CRT. Okay, interface three is capillary versus venous coupling. This addresses that key question. Is this patient fluid tolerant? Here we use the VXUS score, a venous excess ultrasound. VXUS looks at flow patterns in the hepatic veins, portal vein, renal veins, and the size of the IVC. It basically grades how congested the venous system is. A high VXUS score means significant pressure, significant congestion. If VXUS is high, the patient cannot tolerate more fluid. You need to avoid fluids. So VXUS gives us a way to quantify the risk of harm from more fluid. Brilliant. Yeah. What's the last interface? Interface four is the right heart versus pulmonary artery coupling. Assessing for right ventricular failure. The RV is often the forgotten ventricle in sepsis, but it's critical. We look for RV dilation on ultrasound. Is the RV bigger than the LV? And we assess function with TPSC tricuspid annular plane systolic excursion. A TPSC less than 17 millimeters suggests the RV is struggling. Remember, the RV hates volume overload and high pulmonary pressures. So if you see RV failure, be extremely cautious with fluids. Maintain the MAP, mainly with norepinephrine because the RV needs good coronary perfusion fusion pressure. And, and look, if you've gone through all this and the patient is still refractory, circle back, always. Is the diagnosis right? Do we miss a source? And think about adrenal insufficiency. Maybe give hydrocortisone 50 milligrams IV every six hours. And the work isn't over when they leave the ED. Once the shock starts to resolve, we need to think about de-resuscitation. The goal completely flips then, doesn't it? We need to stop maintenance fluids, try to get the patient net negative fluid balance, often using diuretics. We have to prevent those complications from all the fluid we gave during the initial resuscitation. Okay, summing this all up, what does this physiology first approach really mean for clinicians on their next shift? It means getting away from just chasing one number, like BP or lactate. 
It means using our clinical skills, using point-of-care ultrasounds smartly. Use tools like capillary refill time, VTI, VE, XUS, to figure out which part of the circulation is failing, pump, pipes, microcirculation, venous return, and target that. It's about individualizing therapy. Final thought for the listener. How are you going to actively use clinical signs like a modeling score or objective data like a VEXUS score to confidently withhold fluids when appropriate instead of just defaulting to the monitor's blood pressure reading?